morning. It's lovely to see you. Beautiful being. Listen to that sound. This is the sound of the New Zealand summer. Although admittedly, it's only one cicada. Uh, and if you're in the bush, there are many. There's just a few out in the boobs. Some years more than others. But this is the morning. And clearly, the sky is blue. Morning, Robin! And I love this. Gold needleberries, blue sky. A little bit, if I show you. Just a little bit, a few flowers on the Johnson's Blue Geranium, which is, let me put this in the shade, there, now you can actually see the colour. It's, it's difficult because the sun shines so bright. You really can't see. Farah, good morning. There it is. So it's blue around the edge and pink in the middle and it's kind of luminous. And now, now you can see that, and you can look at the foliage, and you can see there's dew on it, it's kind of sparkly. Um, the other thing that's happening here is just a little bit of pink larkspur. It's only a small plant, but um, yeah, I haven't lost it, that's the main thing. It'll make seeds. See, there are seed pods there. So, um, what else have we got in this corner? Underneath the golden elderberries, which I find so wonderful. And uh, last I looked, we might actually get some elderberries this year. Oh, look. Don't always get this. There you go. There's elderberries. They'll turn black and shiny and be tasty. Um, and we've got hydrangeas under here. And, you know, and there's me. Um, and it's an interesting little place to grow hydrangeas because you can see they're wilting a little bit. Because it's really hot. And I have to throw washing water here to um, try and stop them drying out but I always wanted hydrangeas under there and now I got them and there's the hebes and the cabbage tree going up um, and you know this is this is the day things are sort of dry um, I mean there's dew but it'll it'll evaporate before long tail end of the um, campanula just get up close so you can see it I love the uh, Hang on, I'm going to walk closer. I love the white stamens here. There you go. And how they're curled. It's fabulous. So, um, yeah. And I have to throw washing water on this too because you can see some of it's got too dry, too dry and died off. So I don't want that to happen. So I've got to water it. Um, here's the lemon tree. Very... Um, parasitized by mites which have made the leaves all bumpy but it's growing really well and it's got lemons on it so I've got to figure out what it needs to not have mites um, there's the ghost plant hang on we've got sunstrike just say a quick hello to this beautiful purple thing before we disappear up into the garden and uh, we've got to enjoy the ghost plant because I've got to prune it down very soon when I get the opportunity but it's so still today Something's moving! Oh, now you can hear there are two cicadas. They start up eventually. This is actually what I wanted you to see. See, I've got another two hebes up the back there, and they're just covered in flowers. And uh, the bees love them, which is great, because we love bees. And up here there's a purple one, which is pretty much finished. But, uh, let me see. There you can see this one's a hybrid. It's clearly a purple one, like that. Well, not like that, can't see a thing. This one is a native. There we go. It's purple. And uh, it's crossed with a white one to make that. So, you know, they naturally hybridize. And uh, this one is kind of the original. You can just see it's got a few remnants of its flowers on. And... We have hydrangeas, and you think, oh, they're getting old, but just look at this. Just really look. You can see dewdrops, you can see colours, you can see textures. If you get past the fact that the flower's ageing, you start to see magic. Look at that. Just really look at it. It's beautiful. So, um, that'll do. I'll show you that and enjoy it. So today, today it's Tuesday, it's Technique Tuesday, and I, I it's funny, I've got, I've got a live already. Good morning, Andrew. I got a live already. 
last night and I thought, oh, hang on, that's not a technique. It's Technique Tuesday. Ah! So I've got that ready for tomorrow. But today, I thought, what do I want to share with you? And I remember the last week, I, I think I decided I wanted to share this with you. And I want to talk about breathing. Now, why breathing? Because breathing... Oh yeah, there's some road works going on up there. And they're reversing, obviously. Breathing is intimately connected with your autonomic nervous system. And your autonomic nervous system is what runs your body. All of it. Now what is it that I've heard Joe Dispenza say? One cell. Just one cell. Every second. Oh, if I remember the numbers right, I only heard them yesterday. Something between, what is it, a hundred million and a trillion um, cellular reactions in a second? It, uh, you know, whatever the numbers are, they're silly numbers. They're stupid numbers. There's just one cell. Imagine that of the, what is it, 50 to 70 to 120 trillion cells in your body. It's even more silly numbers. Oh, and in the last second, 25 million of your cells died. And you made another 25 million. Did you organize any of that? Did you think about any of that? No. Your autonomic nervous system is doing that for you. Oh my God, it digests your food. Bernadette, good morning. It makes you breathe the right way. It ma manages your temperature. Marilyn, good morning. It does everything for you. It runs, it runs your immune system, runs everything. So... I want to talk about breathing and the way I breathe, which I actually figured out myself. And there's probably other people on the planet who figure this out. And I haven't done an exhaustive research to see if anyone else has figured out this way of breathing. But what I know is that nobody taught it to me. I worked it out for me, but I don't expect I'm the only person who's ever done this. Because there's more people than me on the planet who pay attention and who are aware. And that's really how I, how I stumbled onto this process. So, getting back to the autonomic nervous system, the reason why breathing is this direct path in to regulating and managing your autonomic nervous system, and of course, you know, the people who've been doing meditation, you know, the Buddhists and I think the Chinese and all those people with these ancient practices have known that for thousands of years, is because when you breathe in, and I don't actually know what the system is in the body that makes this happen, but when you breathe in, it kind of activates the part of the autonomic nervous system that is kind of the get up and go, the fight or flight, you know, the survival mechanism, right? The sympathetic nervous system kind of wakes up when you breathe in. When you breathe out, the parasympathetic nervous system, the rest and digest, the relax, the slow down, the brake, the clutch on the, in the car, that activates. So in every single breath, you're kind of saying hello to your nervous system. And if you understand that, you think, oh gee, if I change how I'm breathing, is that going to change how that nervous system runs? And does that mean it's going to send different signals to my body? Well, yeah. So that's why breathing's important, okay? Um, so I have a sort of a, <laughs> I have a, a little teeny tiny background of yoga. And by that I mean that I have a, an established home practice that I do, but I've had very little tuition from other people. And I've had just enough tuition, because, you know, I was a violinist for 20, 25 years, so I know how to work at home, I'm motivated, I know how to do my own practice. I used to do four hours practice a day when I was at university. Not a problem, I have that thing fired and wired. Other things difficult for me, not that. So I can practice at home. So I know that there are different ways of doing yogic breathing. And, you know, a lot of them involve, um, a, lot of them, the one, a lot of the ones that I learned, let's get this right, involved counting a certain number of measures and then, you know, breathing in to maybe for six and holding for four and breathing out for six and four, or, you know, four, 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 the square breathing or a long hold and then out and then a long hold and then and whatever, I don't know. But there was a point in time... And this is to do with the fact that I used to have asthma. Yahoo! I used to have asthma. I don't have asthma anymore because my autonomic nervous system is so much better regulated, my immunity is so much better regulated that I don't have asthma anymore. My autoimmunity is a lot less if there's any left at all. I don't know. I don't think about it. I don't have asthma anymore. But what I found, because I kind of settled on square breathing, you know, four counts in, four counts hold, four counts out, four counts hold which is really good, nothing wrong with it. 
But what I noticed was, as I was doing it, that my body was working really hard. You know, and I want to lengthen it because I know that lengthening the breath slows things down, slows down the brain, all that's good. But the more I was lengthening it, the harder I was working with my breathing apparatus, which is the diaphragm, right? The diaphragm, the little muscles that hold your ribs all together, they're called the intercostals, even your pectorals, the big muscles that you do push-ups with, your back muscles, there's a lot of muscles, and your neck muscles too. There's a lot of muscles involved in breathing. And I started to notice I was working really hard, and I thought, well, this is kind of pr- counterproductive to relaxing. You know, hmm, I'm working really hard to breathe so I can relax. Something wrong here. So I kind of, I don't know, I started playing with it. And I also remember the fact that I'd had some Feldenkrais lessons. Feldenkrais is an amazing, amazing modality. Won't go into it. It's incredible. Don't ask. Oh, I mean, I can spell it, but it'd take half a morning. Um, but if you look in something that, if you put something that sounds like Feldenkrais into the Google internet, um, I'm sure you'll get an answer. It's a movement um, and neuromuscular re-education modality, and it's amazing. And all of that came together in my mind and I started exploring actually letting my body drive my breath. Now what do I mean by that? So, I mean, if you you do this with me, okay, if you choose your own count, right, but you can count for four seconds if you like, or just four heartbeats. I always ended up counting heartbeats because my heartbeat was so powerful and pounding inside my own head when I was sitting still that it wasn't, wasn't like I could count seconds. I had to count heartbeats. So everyone's different. But I would be counting the four and I'd be breathing in and then holding for four and then breathing out and holding four. So set your own speed. And try that. Just do that while I'm talking, right? See if you can. Breathe in for one, two, three, four. And then just gently hold the breath. You don't have to be full up. Just hold the breath. There's tons of oxygen in your blood, believe me. There's a lot more oxygen attached to the hemoglobin in your blood than you're aware of. And breathe out for four. So you should have already been breathing out. And then hold at the bottom. Be empty for four. And then breathe in. However fast your four is, hold for four of the same gently and breathe out for four and then hold four. And that's what I was doing. I call it square breathing. I know I'm not the only person that calls it that. But I like to make it longer so I would start to make it longer and then I would notice I was working hard and it didn't feel good. So then what happened was, and I've been trying to think how to describe this, so I'm just going to have to play with it and hope that you get it. And of course, Facebook isn't showing me your comments, so I don't know really what you think. But anyway, (sighs) it's all right. Keep posting them and I'll reply later. What I decided to do, do you know when you breathe out, for example, and if you can try this now, the next time you breathe out, if you breathe out and you relax at the bottom of the breath, right? We automatically just keep breathing in. But if you relax at the bottom of the breath, there comes a point when you think, I'm really ready to breathe in again now. Carmelina, lovely to see you. So if you breathe out and just rest, let your body rest, let your diaphragm rest, let your breathing apparatus rest at the bottom of the breath until you actually think, okay, I'm ready to breathe in again. And what you're noticing is this kind of, I don't know, there's a change in the feeling in your lungs, I suppose, and, and for me in my gut. It's like, oh, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm really ready to breathe in. And what that is, I think, is your body getting a chance to use up some of the extra oxygen that's just stuck on your cell, blood cells, because most of us habitually overbreathe, because we're stressed. We don't breathe out enough. Right, But rather than breathing out and holding on the air, you just breathe out and you wait and you pay attention until you feel, and it's like the turning of a wave on the seashore. You breathe out, the wave goes out, and there's a point where it pauses and then it comes back in again. I hope this is making sense. So if we start this with the out breath, so you know, just breathe comfortably, stop counting, if you haven't already, stop counting. And just follow your breath, and I mean really follow it with your attention. Feel into your body, feel into your gut, feel into, you know, the bottom, like find the bottom of your ribcage with your fingers if you like, and realize that there's a sheet of muscle that's attached along the bottom of your ribs and it attaches at the back of you, at the bottom of your ribs at the back, and it it basically cuts you in half. 
And that is the sheet of muscle that you use to breathe. And it tightens when you breathe in. <laughs> okay? It actually tightens. It pushes your guts down and out. Your lungs expand. You pull air in. And then as you relax it, you breathe out. Everything collapses again. So to notice the out breath and to just let that big old muscle that's constantly pulling in and air, air in and out for you relax for a little bit is an interesting thing to do because most of us don't ever consciously do that. And of course, staying in the out breath, you're staying in parasympathetic mode. You're staying in rest and digest mode just mm -hmm. half a second or however long it is until you think, oh, okay, I'm ready to breathe in again. Now, so just play with that. Play with that awareness of noticing how long can I rest at the bottom of the breath until my body says I'm ready for more air. And sometimes when you do this, you'll find that you sit there for five or six seconds and other times it's just half a, se half a second. Jen, it's lovely to see you. So try it out as you're sitting here. And when... Like I said, you know, it's like a wave that goes out on the beach, right? You know, you imagine it's a calm beach. It's not a stormy beach. On a calm beach, you know, a wave comes up and then it goes away and there is a point there. It's just this magic moment when everything pauses and then it comes in again. So how long is that magic moment before it turns and in slow motion begins to come in again? So that the, as you start to think, to feel, to imagine that you can breathe in again, that it's very soft and you're allowing your diaphragm to find its own speed and its expansion. And we tend to grab for air. We tend to think, oh, I need to breathe. So, you know, suck it in, buddy. But what if you let your diaphragm find its own speed and its own way? And you have to trust that there's more oxygen on your blood cells than you're used to thinking and feeling, you have to trust that your body knows how to bring the air in in a way that's perfect for you and enough for you. And then as you allow this air to flow in very gently, you might find that it just keeps coming in and in and in and in and in and in. And you fill your lungs and it feels wonderful. And there comes a point when you rest at the top of it. You actually just, and I do this, you know, I just, particularly at the beginning of my meditations, Joe always says, take a breath. And I'm still taking this breath 20 seconds later. It's just coming in and in. And then I sit at the top, four, five, six, eight, ten, I don't know, seconds until my body really wants to let it go. Now, what's going on there? If I'm holding gently, softly, without effort, a lung full of air, well, I'm actually giving my body an opportunity to use some of that oxygen instead of hyperventilating, charging it out, getting some more in. I'm giving my body an opportunity to take what it wants. Also, I've got an opportunity for wastes to be pushed out of, you know, that there's a pulmonary process that goes on where the, the, there's an exchange, there's a gaseous exchange, oxygen goes in, carbon dioxide and waste things go out, and you give it time. Oh, I'm great. It's, I'm, I'm glad you get it, Carmelina. That's wonderful. Thank you. It is very calming because you have to tune into your body and listen and you're actually feeling after a while, you're starting to really feel into the balance of the gases in your blood. And here's the thing, the more carbon dioxide, up to a point clearly, the better. It relaxes you. When we have too much oxygen in our blood, it winds you up. It winds you up. So... You hold the breath easily until you feel like letting it go. And that first long breath that I just told you about, you know, I let it out and it probably takes a while to come out. But then it, I don't rest at the bottom for long because I've just done this big cycle where I've cleaned it all out and it's taken time. And the next one is often a lot shorter. It's, a lot, it's not as deep either. Like my body's got all the stuff going around in my bloodstream. I don't need another big one. I just follow, I let my diaphragm and my body decide on the length of the breath. But the key thing is that my body drives it. And it's this kind of, <sighs> push pulls the wrong word. It, it's kind of like a dance, but more like if, if the, and I've, <laughs> I'm reminded of two friends who do this. If you and a partner 
are standing together in, a, you know, in an open space and you have your hands to get hands up and the other person's got their hands out and your hands in front of their hands, right? But you're not touching and the other person is moving their hands and their body and your job is to follow what they're doing. So it's this very gentle following and paying attention. And uh, I can feel the field changing. You're all starting to get into it as I talk about it. It's following your body. It's, it's letting your body make the space for the air and you appreciating it. And it's letting your body let go of the air when it's ready to rather than you saying, well, I have to breathe in for four and hold for four and breathe out for four. And, put. and I'm sure there are people who do square breathing beautifully. I just never managed to relax into it. It became effortful and I didn't want that effort because, you know, I finally realized the asthma thing. Asthma made me slow down my breathing because I realized, this is where it came from actually, I realized that if your airways are constricted and you are sucking in the air, you are pushing against the constriction. It makes more effort. But if you can allow the air to flow into the space that is there, well, then it's easier. So I learned to slow down my breath, and I also learned that if you have constricted airways, part of the problem is there's, a, there's an imbalance in your blood gases. And if you can increase the carbon dioxide in your blood, those constricted airways are actually going to open up. Because naturally, your body's saying, oh, we've got more carbon dioxide here. I think we'll let in a bit more oxygen. That's actually what happens basis of the Buteyko method for treating asthma well and it's 21 minutes and 51 seconds so there's my 22 minutes gone but I really explained that um so I'd love you to try it in one two three of these breaths you can make a considerable difference to your state of being but it depends upon being extremely present you gotta really pay attention and tune in so I love sharing my, my, and this is a little gem for me. This really works for me. And um, yeah, I'd love to know what you think. Um, and I will be back in three and a half hours to share and give you the update on our San Marie Gomez and how he's doing in the Gambia with his huge journey to become a qualified nurse from poverty. It's a long story, an amazing story, lots of miracles, and we need more miracles. And I know they'll come. I don't know how, but I know they'll come. So, very much love. I look forward to seeing you in three and a half hours if you want to jump on. Otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow with the bells on. Bye-bye.